Right. Now, that certainly was the most significant and, and exciting of, of all the things that I've done in space. I mean, both as an astronomer and an astronaut, to put my two hands on the, the greatest telescope in the world up in space, I mean, what a, what a thrill. Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to still be at MIT in Cambridge in Massachusetts. We are at Building 33. We are going to be talking about being a NASA astronaut and also space systems design. We have Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman joining us on the show. Hello. Hi. Good to be with you. Thank you so much for coming on. It's such an honor and a pleasure. We're very grateful to be able to sit down with you and talk to you. Well, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. For those that don't know, Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman is a former NASA astronaut flying in five missions with over 50 days of time in space. He was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2007 and is now a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, co-director of the Massachusetts Space Grant Consortium, and author of An Astronaut's Diary, which contains excerpts of original recordings he made with a pocket tape recorder. And you can find his link right below in the bio. Jeff, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions. We like asking people, we find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of humanity? Well, it's interesting that you mention stewards of Earth because one thing that you do get as an astronaut is a new perspective on planet Earth. Uh, y you know, before I went up, I, I grew up, I was in, in school in the 60s, the birth of the ecology movement, Earth Day, all that. I mean, I always knew intellectually the Earth is finite, we have to protect our resources, all the things that, that we talk about, problems that have only become worse in the subsequent 50 years. But somehow, when you actually go up there and you can see the Earth as a planet, and, and you, you feel the finiteness of the planet because you're going around it every 90 minutes, and you look at the atmosphere, which you go out on a nice sunny day, and you look up at the big blue sky, and it looks like it goes on forever, and you, you can sort of understand how it, it was hard for some people to get the idea of the finiteness of Earth, the finiteness of our atmosphere, the fact that if you keep putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, eventually it's going to have an impact. But you go up in space and you see how thin that layer of the atmosphere is, it is finite. We can't just do anything we want to our planet and expect that it's not going to have an impact. It's having an impact and you can now see the impact of humanity from a global a cosmic perspective really. And um, you know, it's like how many people have seen pictures of the Grand Canyon? I mean, it's magnificent, this huge hole in the earth. And intellectually, you understand, you see the strata, you know that that's the history of the last few billion years. But man, when you go there and you're in the bottom of the canyon and you're looking up, the, the emotional impact is, it, it's just overwhelming. And, and that's what comes from being in space. So. You know, the current state of the Earth, you know, on the one hand, there's lots to be pessimistic about. You know, are we really going to be able to um, get our hands around climate change and stop the, the sea level from rising? I, I have great doubts just because, I mean, there's so many countries involved, the population is still growing. But on the other hand, there's a lot of things to be optimistic about. Uh, growth of, of interesting technologies, the improvements in, in health care, yeah. uh, genomics, uh, the ability to cure a lot of diseases. And so, uh, like I suspect most times in human history, there are times, there, there are things to be optimistic about, things to be pessimistic about. You know, I, I think humanity is going to survive one way or the other. Um, you never know. Back at the height of the Roman Empire, people probably thought that that kind of life and technology was going to go on forever. And, and who knew? And, uh, you know, we kind of imagine our civilization is going to go on for, forever and, and just keep on improving. We could have a worldwide 
famine, we could have, uh, you know, famine, disease, wars, pestilence, I mean, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so to speak. So, I don't know. Um, I suspect things are going to hopefully be pretty peaceful and for the rest of my life. Um, I'm concerned for my grandchildren, but, you know, just like we've had to take care of the world in, in our lifetimes, uh, that gets passed on to the next generation, and, and all we can do is try to make their job as, as easy as possible, which we're not doing right now, unfortunately. What a profound realization to be able to take the, the animals, the humans, on from the planet, to put them into orbit every 90 minutes, and have that pr perspective for the first time in just the last 50-ish years be augmented to have that, uh, that style of, of awe and, and uh, comprehension of our place in the cosmos. And s being able to see the Anthropocene actually happening with some of the deforestation or acidification yeah. and things uh, of, of that sort. Yeah, deforestation, I mean, over the course of, of my five space flights, I could see the progressive cutting down of the Amazon rainforest, for instance. It's scary. You see all of the agricultural burning that's going on to, to create fields where the, the trees have been cut down. You see uh, how, because of the need for firewood in developing countries, that the, the vegetation on, on hillsides, the, the line of trees goes further up as, as they have to go further up to cut the wood down. Uh, harbors getting silt up, silted up. I mean, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of problems which you, you get a different perspective on when you see them from outside. Yes, yes. And we hope and feel as though the millennials and the Gen Z and further are uh, going to take that stewardship very seriously and solve lo some of these biggest challenges that we have ahead of us. Jeff, let's talk about your journey. So born in New York City and then ended up going through uh, astronomy at Amherst and then PhD in astrophysics at Harvard and then also a master's in material science at Rice, um, getting involved in, in, in getting inspired by science and space. Tell us about how that process happened. Well, I, I was born in New York City and uh, lived there for the first seven years. Then we moved up to the suburbs, but frequently went back into the city. And, you know, my, my parents were uh, very uh, good about exposing me and my brothers to a lot of cultural aspects in the city. We went to concerts, museums, and including the planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium. Yes. And um, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but um, I, I guess my dad was kind of interested in astronomy as well. He had a little two-inch refracting <laughs> telescope, and, um, and, and he knew quite a lot. So um, he enjoyed taking me to the planetarium, and I, I guess he noticed that I, I seemed somehow to react to it. I was fascinated by how the planets moved and, and I learning the names of all the constellations. And now that was back in the 1950s. That's how old I am. And, and um, it was also the, the dawn of the coming space age. We, we had never, you know, I was a kid before we launched Sputnik even, but uh, there was a lot of writing in the newspapers and magazines and shows on television about how pretty soon we were going to have rockets that could orbit the Earth and satellites, and, and my boyhood heroes were Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, because there were no real astronauts at the time. But that, that came, and, and so, yeah, I remember I was in junior high school when Sputnik was launched, and Dad took us out to the high school football field to watch this incredible thing fly over, which now, I mean, we see satellites all the time. We don't think much of it, but uh, that first time, it, it was amazing. And then when people started to go in space, you know, Yuri Gagarin, Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and um, I mean, it was all over the news everywhere. And, uh, you know, every red-blooded American boy, and unfortunately, we didn't have the astronaut role models for girls at the time. We do now, luckily. We have lots of women astronauts. But yeah. in any case, we all wanted to be astronauts when we grew up. <laughs> sure, why not? I, mean, it was, I was fascinated by, by that. Uh, 
However, it became apparent pretty soon that, that all of the early astronauts were military pilots, test pilots mostly, and, and that was not a career for me. But my interest in space, you know, from the planetarium and, and just reading, and um, that continued. I, I did well in school in all the subjects, but I particularly liked science and math and, and, and astronomy, so I, I went to Amherst College and I took the beginning astronomy course. I, I still enjoyed it. And so I took all the physics and math courses that you need for astronomy, which is basic. Astronomy is physics through a telescope and a few astronomy courses as well, and then went to graduate school. The kind of astronomy that I was most interested in was space-based astronomy, uh, looking at high energy radiation. I mean, we get all our information, almost all our information about the universe by electromagnetic radiation. Light, of course, is the easiest. That gets through our atmosphere, as do radio waves. But high energy radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, I mean, it was interesting from a scientific point of view, first of all, because they're created in some of the most energetic parts of the universe, really high magnetic fields, super high temperatures, stellar explosions, I mean, cool stuff, basically. So, and scientifically, it was interesting because it was new. We had just gotten to the point of being able to send X-ray and gamma ray telescopes up above the atmosphere, and so, it, it had the added, in, in addition to the intrinsic interest in this type of, of radiation, it had the added interest that when you're doing something for the first time, you're looking at a new part of, of the spectrum, you're almost guaranteed to find new things. And of course, the early days of X-ray astronomy were very exciting, continues to be actually. We're in a golden age of astronomy these days. Yeah. Um, and so I was working basically with, uh, with space technology, designing telescopes that we launched uh, for my PhD. It was a, carried up by a high altitude balloon. Mm -hmm. uh, I went and did a postdoc over in, in England at the University of Leicester. Mm -hmm. And there we, we use sounding rockets that would go up above the atmosphere, but only stay up for five to 10 minutes at a time. And started work on satellites as well, which then I came back and was working at MIT in the Center for Space Research, basically designing satellites to put up, uh, designing X-ray telescopes to put up in satellites and analyzing data from them. And we, we had some really exciting discoveries. Uh, probably the most interesting, this was back in the late 70s, uh, what we call X-ray bursts. That was probably the, the most fascinating part of my, my astronomical career. These are, you look at these x-ray sources and, and they, they're, they're sort of going along, not doing very much, and then all of a sudden, boom! And there's this huge flash Ooh. of radiation which gradually dies away. But then, you know, a certain amount from minutes or hours or days later, on semi-periodically, boom, again. And what we finally, after a, a lot of observations, unraveled the mystery, uh, these are neutron stars which are orbiting around other stars, sucking hydrogen onto the surface of the neutron star where it gets compressed by the gravitational field, and eventually it's compressed enough that it triggers nuclear fusion. So it's, it's like a big hydrogen bomb 10 miles in diameter, so quite fascinating. And, uh, you know, I was prepared to go on with my astronomy career and, and was just about at the point where I was going to be looking for a tenure track position to become a professor eventually. Um, yeah, by that time, by the way, I, I was married. I, I married an, an English woman when I was living over there and, and our oldest son was born in England. Now we were living in Cambridge. Uh, I was working in Cambridge. We were living in the Boston area thinking, you know, this would be a nice place to spend the rest of our lives. Um, and along came NASA in the mid to late 70s. Let's, let's, we'll get there in a moment. Oh, because okay, you want to know how I, I would. Yeah, I, I want to know, uh, we need oh, to spend sure. a little more time on okay. just the in crazy coolness of, okay. of, of uh, X-ray and gamma ray mm -hmm. astronomy. Sure. Because you spent so much time on sure. this. seven and years. Yeah, seven years of time, and also it continues to be, like you said, a big renaissance yeah. in astronomy. Yeah, yeah. So you were explaining how 
it's it's like a binary or a triple star system potentially multiple star system mm -hmm. and one of the stars is larger than the other star and it's it's well one of the stars is not larger physically it's smaller it's yes the neutron okay. star is only maybe 10 miles in diameter but wow. it's got a lot of gravity it, it has the mass of a big star it has the mass right of what a big well star. what happens is you know you have a star like our sun and there's a balance. The, the nuclear fusion inside the center of the sun creates a lot of heat. It wants to push everything out, and yes. gravity wants to suck yes, it back yes. in, and, and it's in a nice balance. Once you use up all the fuel, the, you've burned your hydrogen, you maybe burn, burn the helium, but eventually you've burned out the fuel, then our sun will collapse into a white dwarf, and at that point, um, it's actually the Pauli exclusion principle prevents all the electrons from getting into one place and, and that creates an outward pressure. So the, the white dwarf is, is much smaller than, than our sun. And that's about all that's going to happen to our sun. It's going to throw off some, some big shells that will eventually burn up the earth, and, but that's not for a few billion years, so don't lose any sleep over it. But the but white dwarf sun weighs? the mass if our sun were bigger if if a star is bigger then it has more gravity when it collapses and it can actually push those electrons which were holding a, apart the white dwarf can push those electrons right into the nuclei and so the protons combine with electrons to make neutrons and you you end up with a a huge atomic nucleus 10 miles in diameter, that's a neutron star. It has to be several times more massive than our, than our sun. It's, an, I mean, an incredible concept uh, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that you can have this. And, um, and so on the surface of the neutron star, the, the gravity is, is quite strong. And if it's in orbit around another star, like a, a, you know, a bigger star with a, an atmosphere, it can actually suck the atmosphere off that other star. Wow. And as that gas falls onto the neutron star, it heats up and gives off it, it to millions of degrees, really, and gives off x-rays. Um, you can all, you know, there's other ways to make x-rays. I mean, you can, if you have strong magnetic fields and you get charged particles moving around in a magnetic field, they can create electromagnetic radiation as well. And you get a strong enough magnetic field and, and, and powerful electrons, you, you can make x-rays as, as well. It's all very high energy, high yes, temperatures, yes, yes. cool stuff. Yes, and then briefly teach us about how to do uh, x-ray and gamma ray uh, uh, analysis versus, uh, this is a, versus mm -hmm. the big old mirror for reflecting mm -hmm. the light on a telescope. What does it look like on for x-ray and gamma ray? Well, the, the early days of X-ray astronomy, uh, the X-ray detectors really came out of nuclear physics. In fact, my PhD thesis advisor originally was a nuclear physicist, but you know, they, they adapted these uh, X-ray, gamma-ray detectors to astronomy. And the only way you could figure out where the X-rays were coming from would be to make collimators. If you imagine you know, like a, a, a gun barrel, but lots of them stacked together so that when you look through them, it's like looking through a soda straw. And so if you see an X-ray, you know where it's coming from. But it was pretty crude. You couldn't get good images. For X-rays, as long as they're not too energetic, uh, it was discovered that you could actually make a mirror that would focus x-rays, not by bouncing them off directly like light, mm -hmm. because uh, x-rays would be absorbed, but if you have it at a very shallow angle, the x-ray will hit it and then bounce off. And if you have just the right shape, uh, double mirror, parabola, and hyperbola, you can actually focus an image with x-rays. And, and that was the real breakthrough in x-ray astronomy, and that we could take pictures of objects in x-rays and and we had uh, there's been a succession of x-ray telescopes culminating in the current Chandra x-ray observatory which is a, a large x-ray telescope and uh, it's just been spectacular and and what we can do now in astronomy which is one of the reasons why why it's a golden age of astronomy is we have these telescopes throughout the uh, electromagnetic spectrum so you can get 
uh, radio pictures of, of something and, and you know radio waves are created by certain processes and then you can get infrared and optical and ultraviolet and x-ray and gamma ray each of which gives you different type of information about what's going on out there yes. and and so we have this broad spectrum astronomy which we can do now plus much bigger telescopes, um, yes. Hubble telescope, which I yeah, is an yeah. yes. important so part of my this, life, yes. uh, is still going strong, and uh, and some super big telescopes that have been developed on the ground, ground yeah, yeah. together with the ability to get around some of the um, distorting image uh, of images created by the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, it's it, it it's almost incredible what what earthbound astronomers are able to do now. Um, so it, it, astronomy, it's really exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's been, like you said, it's the uh, a big big renaissance happening with a lot of the exponential technology, the broad uh, uh, co cosmic imaging that's happening across all different parts of electromagnetic spectrum, so interesting. And also more trips up uh, to space, more higher tech equipment, better equipment on the ground, mm -hmm. then you end up being selected by NASA in 1978. Well, what happened um, when the early astronauts were selected and I, I saw that they were all military pilots, which was not a career for me, I figured, oh yeah, flying in space, that'd be really cool, but I never looked on it as a, a realistic career prospect. You know, I was going to be an astronomer and, and do high energy astrophysics. But along comes the space shuttle, uh, which NASA was testing in the mid to late 70s with the, the, the drop tests of, of the Enterprise. And getting ready, they thought, to launch the first orbital shuttle in 1979. And they needed new astronauts. But the thing about the shuttle, they had a crew of up to seven people and they only needed two pilots. And so that's what really opened things up for scientists, uh, medical doctors, engineers. So when uh, I was working at MIT in the late 70s and, and NASA put out a call for new astronauts and when I saw that they're looking for scientists, wow, you know, this is, uh, yeah, I always dreamed of doing this. And all of a sudden, it's no longer an unrealistic. It now becomes a realistic goal. And I put in my application. And I was lucky I got selected the first time around. I mean, some wow. people have, I, I know one of, one of my colleagues applied four times before he got selected. But I was in the first group of space shuttle astronauts. Yeah. That was the group that came in with the first American women, Sally Ride and, and her wow. uh, colleagues. And, uh, and all of us flew, 35 of us, and we all flew at least once. I was fortunate. I stuck around and yeah. ended up with five flights, and I was very fortunate. Yeah. And, okay, so this, what does the team, this first crew of 35 of you, what do you go through? What are the operations and the trainings, and what does this all look like? Well, um, when we showed up, nobody had flown on the shuttle before. <laughs> And it, that, it was very different from when a group of astronauts showed up, um, you know, 20 years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Because by that time, we knew how the shuttle operated. We knew how to train people for the shuttle. I mean, nobody actually knew how to train us. We, we originally, we got trained by engineers who had built the shuttle, and they would tell us how... You know, this piece of equipment was made out of 1327 aluminum and, and, you know, these are the kind of rivets we use. I mean, no, we don't need to know that. We're operators. And actually, given my educational background, one of the, a after our initial training, uh, we clearly weren't going to fly for a while. I mean, the shuttle did not fly in 79. It didn't fly until 81. And there were a lot of older astronauts who were going to fly before our group. So we, we were all given on the job assignments. Um, one of my first assignments was testing out the uh, shuttle software and a software lab out at, uh, in, in Downey, California, where the shuttle was, was built. But another job that I got, I think given my educational background and the, the fact that I had worked at a university, was to work with the training people and actually develop 
techniques for how to train us. So I actually wrote one of the training manuals that was for quite a few years was was used just to to show the people, you know, this, this is the sort of information that we need. As astronauts, we are operators. Um, we have to have a very broad knowledge of many, many different systems in, in the, the shuttle or whatever spacecraft we're flying on. Very different from the engineers who work in mission control where you have you know, one person who's responsible for the propulsion system and has to have a really deep knowledge of that system, but he doesn't necessarily have to have a deep operational knowledge of how the um, electrical power system works, although that may influence the propulsion because all these systems are interconnected. But you know, basically the astronauts need a broad, but maybe not quite so deep a, a knowledge as the working engineers. We need to know how to operate a system. We need to know what kind of failures can occur, and then of course, what do we do if something yes. fails? Yeah, so the, m the major thing is to know the protocols for the operations of spaceflight and to be very familiar with all of those processes. And in many cases, when we're working with new systems, we have to develop the processes. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was one of the, the things I spent a lot of time on was, given my scientific background, uh, I, I would often be assigned to work with scientists who were designing experiments to be done in space. And given my knowledge of the shuttle systems and the environment of weightlessness, I could often see things about the way they had designed their experiment, you know, given that they weren't familiar with operating in space things that weren't going to work properly and and so I could offer ways to to fix them in fact one of one of my most important jobs as an astronaut I when someone would hand me a piece of equipment or a procedure and I would try to break it basically not by hitting it with a hammer but but by you know what what kind of operational problems could we run into because I'd much rather figure that out on the ground when we can actually work with the engineers and do something about it and develop workaround procedures rather than wait till we're up in space and time is limited and, and you don't want to have something fail up there and then yes. not know what to do about it. Although <laughs> that happens as well. But the process of having spent a lot of time on the ground working with malfunctions and how to deal with them yes. It, it, it equips you better even when something happens up in space that, that you didn't expect. You have the mindset and, and the confidence that you can deal with it, and, th and that's important. Yeah, yeah. And the missions then, so 1985 with Discovery, and that, that was my first mission. And that was to rescue a, malfa a malfunctioning satellite. Well, no, okay. no, okay. actually, well, first I should start. the. My first flight assignment was to fly in June of 1984. Um, but back in the day, uh, shuttle flights were getting canceled all the time, equipment was failing, flights would get canceled, you'd, you'd get bumped to another flight. So for, for various reasons, the flight was supposed to go before ours got canceled. So, so that crew got put onto our flight and then we got moved to a flight in August of 1984. They had a problem on the launch pad in, in June, so they took the August flight and we got bumped all the way to January of 1985. The satellite that we were supposed to launch wasn't ready, so we got bumped to another flight, which was supposed to go in March of 85. They had a problem with the shuttle. We didn't launch till April. The original purpose of that first mission was just to take two satellites up punch them out of the cargo bay of the shuttle and each of them has an upper stage which would then yeah, take them yes. up to geostationary orbit because yes, yes. they were both communication satellites. It's a four-day mission and they go up, punch out the satellites and come back home. Why did it require astronauts to punch out the satellites? Well, that's a very interesting question and the, the answer which was determined after the Challenger uh, disaster was that you don't. Remember that when the shuttle was originally built it was thought that it, it could fly a lot more frequently than it ended up being able to fly. It turned out it was a much more complex, it was a reusable vehicle, but reusing it, refurbishing it, turning it around, took a lot longer and was much more complicated than people had originally hoped. 
not surprisingly maybe because we had you know we had never built a reusable spacecraft before you you would have thought that the first reusable spacecraft would have been a small x vehicle you know a, a follow on from the x15 something like that so that we could actually learn something about how do you how do you refurbish a, a spacecraft once it's come back from space no, the space shuttle was, I mean, it's huge. It was the size of a DC-9 airplane. And, and you know, the fact, the idea that, that this was the first reusable, this huge vehicle. And there are, you know, political and, and policy reasons why NASA had to build the shuttle that it did. It, it had to satisfy all users because the original idea was the shuttle would replace all expendable rockets. And it was considered at the time it was going to be, it had so much redundancy in it it was going to be incredibly safe. Uh, the crew would not need an escape system. Mm -hmm. First time that that was ever done. Wow. And and so yeah, if you had to launch a satellite, you just put it in the shuttle. And yeah, there are people there. And and so we would we would go through the operations to deploy the the satellites. After Challenger, uh, people realized that despite everything that had been done to make the shuttle as safe as possible you could still have loss of life and so the decision was made no there's no reason to have to have people just to launch a satellite so satellite launches were returned to expendables and and more or less we use the shuttle for things where it made sense to have people on board but before challenger and that was my first flight was um, we did everything with the shuttle so the, the idea was we were just going to go up on a relatively short mission, uh, launch these two satellites. We had one or two medical experiments that we were carrying out, uh, but then come home. What happened was that the, the first satellite we launched, that was fine. It, you know, it, we, we launched the satellite, then we get out of the way because 45 minutes later the engine turns on and that satellite goes up to geostationary orbit. The second satellite we deployed out of the shuttle and that normally is the end of our responsibility but we looked at it for a while and there's a little antenna on the top which is supposed to pop up oh. which we had seen many times in the simulator because we had done this many many times for practice yes. well it never nothing happened after about five minutes you know i i turned to one of my my crewmates there Something's wrong here. So, uh, so I called down to Houston. Uh, you know, the the Omni antenna has not popped up. So the suspicion already was, um, you know, something is really wrong inside the satellite. They told us to move away from it just in case the engine was going to fire 45 minutes later. Although we really didn't expect it to fire because the whole timing sequence never started up. That that would have popped up that yes. antenna. Yes, yes. So we, um, we moved away, and sure enough, it didn't fire. Uh, and then they said, well, don't move any further away, just, and, and we'll think of what to do. And you know, we didn't know what they were going to come up with. I mean, what, what can we do? We had, we had no special tools on board. We, we had no training on what, what to do if the satellite didn't work, because nobody yeah. had ever anticipated that. But it did turn out. The first thing you look for when something fails is what we call a single point failure because if you have redundancy, it's much less likely that, that multiple things will fail in the same way. But there was one single switch on the outside of the satellite which is normally closed when the satellite's in the cargo bay. It's part of the whole timing uh, sequence. It's a safety measure. You you don't want the engine to fire when it's inside the shuttle. That would be a bad day. Yeah. So this switch has to open up when when the satellite leaves the shuttle. And and the thought was there's a little micro switch underneath the external uh, big part of the switch. And you know maybe it, it's sticky or something. And and so that was really the only thing that we had access to. But they basically had us um, build some special tools. I mean, it was a, sort of like that Apollo 13 moment where they, they throw all the stuff on the table that, that we have on board and they say, all right, you've got to come up with a tool to do this. And they came up with uh, two objects that, that looked kind of like fly swatters. So we became known as the SWAT team. And, and then uh, when they were telling us all about the, what they were thinking, I, I remember the call coming up saying, 
um, Discovery Houston, we're, we're thinking of several different options for what we might do. Uh, one of which involves a spacewalk, and you know that magic word, spacewalk, yeah. because for every shuttle flight, two astronauts get trained on how to use a spacesuit and do a spacewalk, just yes. as a contingency in case something happens that would prevent the shuttle from coming home. Yes. And so I was one of those two people. And I guess uh, we had gotten good reports from our trainers who had watched us training underwater, and they said, "Yeah, you know, you can you can trust Jeff and Dave to they they know what they're doing." And so, sure enough, they had us go out and attach these tools to the end of the robotic arm, and uh, that was an amazing experience because I, I had never I hadn't I mean, you always dream about doing a spacewalk if you're an astronaut. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the the closest you can come to really be in space. space. You know. You're, Here's my hand. Here's a vacuum. I mean, I'm, yeah. you're really in space with a big wraparound view with your helmet. But um, what I found was the the value of the training because I'll you know, I'll never forget. I I opened the hatch and sort of slid out on my belly. I was facing down to the floor of the the shuttle's cargo bay because I had to go over to the toolbox to get the tools I needed for the job, and thinking to myself. You know that the training was really good because I I felt comfortable. I knew what I was doing, um, and it, it felt really very much like when I was in the water tank. Which is and the reason we train in the water is because this a space shoot, suit on on the Earth weighs about 300 pounds, and and so you can't really do anything wow. in it. But in the water, you float, yeah. and and they they balance you out with lead weights, so you're neutrally buoyant. You don't float, you don't sink, and and so you can actually work in the spacesuit underwater. It's it's as close as we can come to uh, actually being out in space. And so I remember thinking to myself, it really feels like when I was underwater. This, that was great training. Then after I had all the tools, I, I turned around to go back and I looked up and there was the earth and the sky and the stars and I knew I wasn't in the water tank anymore. It was, uh, that was a, a, an incredible thing. And, and we did the job and um, got good, good ratings for how we moved around in a spacesuit and, and that turned out, you know, totally by chance did I happen to be, you know, after four different flight assignments to be on that flight yes, when yes. that satellite happened to fail yes. and I got to do a spacewalk yeah. and then eight years later when it was time to choose a crew f to go up and rescue Hubble because the Hubble telescope repair was such a critical mission for NASA they said only people who have previously done spacewalks are eligible to get assigned to go fix Hubble and I had my union card for spacewalking. <laughs> Your union card. This was 93 with Endeavor. That's right. And that was my fourth you, space flight. That was your fourth space right. flight. And, uh, and because you had your card for going and doing a spacewalk right. and fixing a satellite. Right. That's so interesting. And it's so crazy how uh, back then it, you could get bumped and bumped and bumped. And now it seems as though uh, the, the amount of space flights that we're doing and, and also not needing crew to deploy the actual satellite, but automating that process uh, to potentially save lives. And then also, I want you to speak, even before we get to Columbia, Atlantis, et cetera, teach us about the EDL, entry, descent, and landing process, because yeah. <laughs> we've heard that it's like going over the Niagara Falls in a barrel and uh, having that barrel be on fire. <laughs> well, I would think going over Niagara Falls uh, is, well, first of all, it doesn't take nearly as long. and. Uh, well, you would be weightless for uh, for part of that, at least. So, in, in any case, regardless of the of the aptness of the analogy, um, yeah, I, I I didn't know what to expect the first time. Um, our commander had been in space once before, and and so he gave us a little bit of a, a you know introduction, and and he. he he could actually see the G meter, which would measure the the acceleration. And, and he told me, because I was sitting uh, in, in behind where I couldn't actually see it, he said, let me know when you think we've got up to about 1G and you'll be surprised, you know, back to one Earth gravity. Yeah. So anyway, um, 
you turn the shuttle around, you fire the maneuvering engines to slow you down yeah. just a little bit, and that drops the far side of your orbit, you know, 45 minutes away on the other side of the Earth, your orbit takes you down into the upper reaches of the atmosphere. Yeah. And so after the engines are fired, you know you're coming home. You're still weightless, you're still in space, but there's nothing, you, you're coming home one way or the other. Um, of course, we have to fire the engines at just the right time yes. uh, so that we end up the at location. the right place. Yeah. Because unlike other spacecraft, the shuttle can't land in the water, it can't land anywhere, it can only land in a runway. So they never bothered like with jungle training or things like that for us flying the shuttle because you know if, if you don't land on a runway you don't need to worry about survival training because you're not going to survive. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were certain emergency procedures which we did practice you know if, if the, the shuttle has a hard landing um, and you have to evacuate things like that but basically uh, so anyway we're on our way back and not too much happens. Um, what I would do, I, I, I would take uh, a pen or pencil and, and just let it float in front of my face. Mm. And then what you notice very slowly, it starts to move down because you hit the very upper regions of the atmosphere and the friction starts to yeah. slow you down and that decelerates the shuttle and that's what creates the initial onset of gravity. So it gets down, I'll pick it up, now it's coming down a little faster. Now it's coming down much faster. Now I reach over to get a, my camera to take a picture out the window. These were heavy Nikon F4s, F5s. Um, normally you just touch it with your finger, it floats up and you can just maneuver it around go to pick it up, oh, what's this? You know, it has weight. weight yeah. uh, it's amazing how used you get to yeah. being weightless. Um, and I want to have a clarification point quick. So this is different, the Soyuz descent. Oh, the shuttle is, is yes. totally different from Soyuz. Soyuz is yes. a space capsule. capsule. And that's where and that the comes, barrel on Yeah, fire. that comes yeah. in much steeper and much faster yes. with a much higher G-load. Which is what they normally do when they return from the International Space Station. Right now, all flights to and from the station are on the Russian Soyuz. Yes. But even once we start getting the uh, SpaceX Dragon or the Boeing Starliner, uh, those are still capsules. So yeah, they'll, yes. they'll have a, uh, you know, people who, some of my colleagues who have, have ridden the Soyuz as well as the shuttle, uh, will tell you, I mean, the shuttle is a pretty rough ride on the way up, especially the first two minutes when you're burning the solid boosters. But it's a very smooth ride home compared to the, the Soyuz, which is particularly when the, the parachute opens, there's a huge shock, and then you're <laughs> swinging back and forth, and, and then when you actually hit the ground, yeah. uh, they, they do fire retro rockets just before you hit, but it, it really is, is a hard hit. They tell people, you know, keep your mouth closed when you mm -hmm. hit the ground because you don't want to bite your tongue off. It, yeah. it, I mean, it's, it's that much of a shock. Yeah. No, the shuttle is much more civilized when you come <laughs> home from space, you know, with wings. Um, then what happens is when you get down to about 250,000 feet, uh, you, you're, you first start picking up the atmosphere about 400,000 feet. 250,000 feet is when you really start to heat up. And that's when looking out the back window of the shuttle, which I, you're looking into the wake, just, just like a motorboat leaves a wake behind mm -hmm. it. You know, the entering spacecraft yes. leaves, it leaves a hypersonic weight, which is wow. glowing at, at thousands of degrees. And, and you have to have a heat shield. Well, that's, without that, I mean, the shuttle is made of aluminum, the body, which, which melts at, you know, less than a thousand degrees. And, and you've got temperatures of many thousands of degrees out there. And do we so, know what the optimal material is for the heat shield? Well, the heat shield uh, for all previous spacecraft had been expendable. It was a, what we call an ablative material, which gradually melted. Uh, it was kind of a phenolic resin 
in, in, embedded in a honeycomb, and, and as it heated up, it would melt, and that would take the heat away. But it was a one-shot only, and it was rather heavy. So it was a big challenge for the shuttle devising a reusable and very light heat shield, and yes. that's what all those ceramic tiles, you know, they have like upwards of 30,000 tiles on the shuttle, and they have to be really light but very, very good insulators. And, and it was an amazing development uh, to, to build those tiles. Getting them to stick onto the shuttle turned out to be harder than people had imagined, but that, that was a whole other story. They finally did figure that out. And, and it works, it works, so. Um, Post 250,000 feet then. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I was just mesmerized by this light show going on, uh, you know, the, the shimmering lines of the wake, and between each of the tiles, they have these little gap fillers, and every once in a while, a tiny piece of that would come off, and so you'd be looking at the re-entry wake, and every once in a while, you'd get these uh, little flashes of light, you know, zing, zing, zing and, Every time I saw one of those, I would I would think to myself, well, I hope that wasn't anything important. important yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't. You know, we we got to the ground, and and then, you know, I was I was feeling really heavy. So I I told the commander, uh, hey, uh, Bo, we must be up at one G now, right? So yeah, we're about a third of a G. You know, <laughs> because after being used to weightlessness for uh, we we had been up for a whole week, as it turned out. Um, Gravity, it, it affects you much more strongly. Up for a week in zero G. Right. And then, yeah, you your body gets used to that. It's yeah. Just, I wonder I mean, how I wasn't, the I wasn't, biology I wasn't, changes. Well, I wasn't physically, week. you know, in one week, uh, your body doesn't change that much. Uh, people spending six months on the space, space station, station. They, they have to be very concerned about changes in their body. They have to exercise regularly. Uh, we had a treadmill on board and um, everybody else ran on the treadmill, so I figured, well, I better try it out. So um, in, in order to be able to run on a treadmill, you, you have to put on a body harness with bungee cords to hold Correct, you down yeah. so that you can run. So you know, I ran for about 20 minutes, and then as I released the bungee cords and floated back up, I, I realized, you know, while I was running on the treadmill, I felt like I was back on Earth. Mm. I don't need that. I'm going to be on Earth for the rest of my life. I'm, I want to be in space. And so that's the last time I ever exercised in space, which for a week or two, I mean, you, you can go without, you can lie in bed for two weeks and, and you're not going to suffer any undue harm. But for six months, yeah, you have yeah. to exercise, no question. And, and they spend two to three hours a day up in the space station exercising. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. But um, there's still, when you, when you get back into a gravity field, um, strange things happen. Correct. I mean, right after we landed. Um, Can you teach us about the landing process? So you're oh, orbiting yeah. and then yeah. you finally come. Yeah, well, what, what happens, that, that, that heating phase where you, you see this incandescent weight behind you, that lasts for about 10 minutes and, and then by that time, you're you're pretty much up to one G, and and now the the other incredible thing then was we were landing in Florida. So as we came over the shuttle, the uh, the the uh, California coast, um, one of the things when you're in orbit and you look at the Earth going by you, it moves at about the same rate as the Earth when you're looking out of it, uh, an airplane a window. You know, you're going a lot faster, but you're much further away. You don't yeah. really have any sense of speed mm -hmm. because, you know, there's no vibration, there's no wind, there's no billboards rushing by you. Coming over the coast of California, though, you know, now we're, we're down, you know, many times closer to the Earth than we were when we were in orbit. So now the ground is really screaming by, and, and that's when I first got the sensation of speed was yeah. crossing the California coast. And then we basically maneuver. It, it's all about energy management. You want to get to the runway with a little bit of extra energy just so that you, you don't want to get there with too little energy. It's much easier to bleed off the energy. So you basically fly over, um, and then when you get right over the landing field, you, you do a big circle, mm. heading alignment circle, they call it. You line up with a runway, yeah. and then when you finally go subsonic, 
you, 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 by the way, you have those two booms and you can feel a little shock wow. as, you, as you're going down lower than the speed of sound. And then the pilot takes over manually, and this is what the pilots have been training to do hundreds of times in the shuttle training aircraft and in the simulators. And then they line up with a runway and they, it, it, of course it's a glider, so you only get one shot at landing, but that's what they train for. And we had a great landing. Only problem with our landing that time, there was a, there was a big crosswind. And the shuttle was designed so that the nose wheel could steer, which is how you keep in the center even if there's a crosswind. But there was a problem with the uh, redundancy problem and the uh, potential single point failure, which could turn the wheel over hard, which would be very bad. So in those early days, the pilots weren't using the nose wheel steering the way to, to steer the shuttle on the runway would be differential pressure on the brakes on the rear tires. Yeah, we had a strong crosswind, so uh, our commander had to continually use one brake, and, and we had the, the original brakes at the time. They, they were subsequently improved. Anyway, the net result, it overheated, yeah. led to a blowout. It's the only tire blowout we ever had. This was my first flight. First we had, we had gone through all this incredible stuff with the satellite failure, uh, an unscheduled spacewalk, the first time NASA had ever done an unscheduled, unplanned spacewalk in its entire history, a rendezvous in space with the satellite. <laughs> and, you know, I felt this touching down on the runway. You could feel the deceleration. The nose wheel comes down. Gradually, you know, we were coming to a stop. We were just about stopped, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, what an incredible week, a mission, all these things we did, but now it's over, nothing can go wrong, <laughs> and everything, you know, I thought one of the fuel tanks had blown up or something. It, it was the, the tire had blown. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, luckily, we were just about stopped, so there was no adverse wow. effect. So we, if, if that had happened at a high speed, you could have run yes. off the runway. Yes. What was the speed at landing? Speed at landing is, is about uh, 250 miles okay. an hour, so much, much yeah. faster than a normal it's airplane. It's interesting that you can slow it down from uh, orbiting at uh, what, whatever speed it's going Well, this, the, the slowing down from 18,000 miles an hour in orbit is all due to the friction of the atmosphere. You, we slow wow. it down just a few hundred miles an hour with with the uh, engine firing, awesome. but that yeah. lowers our orbit enough so that we hit the atmosphere and then the atmosphere. If the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, yeah, correct. Yes. like if we were landing on the moon, all that slowing down has to be done with Fuel. rocket yeah. propellant, yes. which we don't have that much propellant. Interesting. <laughs> so From so we couldn't do it. From 18,000 miles an yeah. hour down to 250, all by using, almost all by using just the atmosphere in the And windshield. of course that kinetic energy is transformed into heat energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, um, I, I want to, we'll get to the other missions, just quickly want to know about the, uh, we're not using shuttles technology anymore. Is that right? Uh, um, well, we're certainly, we're not f in the new um, vehicles. Most of them, with one exception, are capsules. Are they, capsules. Right. Uh, Sierra Nevada Company is building a, a wing vehicle, a much smaller yeah. vehicle than the space shuttle. Uh, and they hopefully will be test flying it in the next year or two. So the two are either capsule vehicles, which is on the booster, or as well as the winged vehicle, which is attached to the booster. Well, actually, the Sierra Nevada, uh, it's called the, the Dream Chaser. And, and that's small enough that it can actually sit on top on of the top rocket, of the which rocket. is where a spacecraft ought to be. I mean, that's... It's weird to the, put it. Yeah, the, yeah. the shuttle was so big, it had to be <laughs> on the side, and, and that made it vulnerable to the, the foam falling off and hitting the tiles, which is what eventually led to the Columbia disaster. Oh, and that's... We know that that's what led to oh, the yeah, Columbia absolutely. disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah, okay, interesting. So now always on top of the rocket and um, interesting capsule versus um, that wing technology. Okay, so, so then um, to the, uh, the Columbia deployed uh, uh, UV uh, astronomy laboratory, As is Astro One was the deployment? NASA um, signed up to, uh, with the European Space Agency to have the European Space Agency create the space lab 
and there were two aspects of Space Lab. There was a, a module of the Space Lab, which is what most people think of, which you could put experiments in, and, and it had special computers, and, and that was used for a lot of scientific missions. But the Europeans also built a pointing system for telescopes, which could be mounted uh, outside in the shuttle cargo bay, and you could do ultraviolet or X-ray astronomy, things where you have to be above the atmosphere. And as an astronomer, I got assigned to the first ultraviolet astronomy mission. Yeah. Actually, another astronomy colleague who had also gone to Amherst College, so we had two Amherst astronomers on the shuttle, and two non-astronaut, we called them payload specialists, but they were scientists, astronomers, who had worked on the telescopes that we were carrying up, and so we flew them. So we had four PhD astronomers on that flight. We were scheduled, I actually was assigned to that flight before my first flight uh, went, so I, I knew already when, during my first flight what my second flight would be. And we were assigned to fly in March of 1986 in conjunction with Halley's Comet, because we wanted to get ultraviolet observations of the comet. So we would have been the very next flight after the Challenger disaster. So we were very close to that crew. We knew them well. It was a, I was in the simulator that day. Um, the last nine minutes, we come out of the simulator to watch the launch on TV. And of course, we saw the explosion, the disaster, and um, we didn't go back to the simulator that day. But early on, we didn't know what the problem was. Obviously, there were a few people who, who already knew about the, the uh, O-ring seals, but we didn't. Uh, possibly, it, I mean, it was a terrible disaster, but possibly whatever the problem was could be fixed relatively quickly. And so they, NASA told us to continue our training. And that was really strange. The next day, we had to go in for an ascent simulation after having watched the Challenger disintegrate the day before. And so we, I remember we told the uh, simulator crew, hey, how about not giving us any malfunctions? Let us have a clean run to orbit. And, and so we did. But um, uh, we trained for, I don't remember, a week, two weeks. But, and, and then it became apparent that this was a serious problem and we were going to be standing down for a couple of years. And so we stopped training. And in fact, we didn't fly that mission until 1990. Yeah. And the disaster was, again, 80. The disaster was, was the end of January of 86. Of 86, yeah, wow. Yeah, that was the Challenger. And the next flight after we, we would have flown four, four years later. No, was two, it was two in 88. 88 was yeah, that. Yeah, it was yeah. about two and a half years. Wow, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, they had to completely, not only did they redesign the solid booster seals, but they then went deep into the design of all of the shuttle systems, and they found a lot of other potential failures. Um, many of which were corrected. So the shuttle, when it flew again in 1988, was much safer than it was. That was probably the safest flight of the, that the shuttle ever made. Because at that point, if anybody could think of anything that needed attention, they would get management's ear. Unfortunately, as time goes on, you, you get used to success. And we had, you know, many years of successful shuttle flights and, and people then start taking safety for granted. And that, that's a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened with Columbia, where people had seen the foam falling off for many flights, but it never really did any serious damage to the shuttle, and so you sort of get used to it, and you say, oh yeah, foam falls off, don't worry, it's happened before, until it, you get a bad luck, and the big piece makes a big hole in your wing, which nobody knew about, and we lost the crew. And just to take a moment to, you know, be with how much, uh, with them and how much work um, and hard work they put into pushing the boundaries of the edge of what we knew and how hard they worked and we're really grateful for them to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was very painful for, for everybody. 
not just for the astronauts. I mean, everyone in mission control and the people in Florida who prepare the shuttles for flight. I mean, uh, an amazing group of people. They, I mean, the, the shuttles for them were like living, breathing objects. I mean, they had a personal relationship. And yeah, they were devastated that the crew had been lost, but, but they were also devastated that they had lost their vehicles, uh, you know, that they had grown up with and worked with for so many years. And then, so teach us on, um, in 1990, when you go up with um, Columbia, the Astro 1 UV, yeah. Well, uh, the, f the first flight of the, of the Astro payload, we, we had a lot of problems on that mission. Um, there are two computers, special space lab computers, which control the operation of the telescopes. And the very first day of the mission, one of them burned up. Not a nice feeling to wake up in the morning and smell smoke on a spacecraft. Yeah. Um, and then on the fourth day, well, we could keep operating with just one computer. Then on the fourth day of what was supposed to be, what was a nine-day mission, the second computer burned up. Oh, no. um, well, what they discovered was, we didn't know this until after we got back, but during all that time, the four years that it had been sitting on the ground, uh, periodically they would turn the system on and uh, all the computers are air-cooled, and the air comes through a filter because you don't want dust coming in. And nobody had thought to clean the filters. Mm. They were full of dust. Mm. And so we weren't getting proper airflow over the computers, and so the computers overheated. And that's one of the problems when you're in weightlessness. There's no convective cooling because hot air doesn't rise. And so you have to blow air across the computer with a fan. And if you don't have enough air intake, it overheats. And, and uh, luckily, together with Mission Control, we figured out a way to continue the mission. So we, <coughs> we did get some useful science out of it, but it was very frustrating. Yeah. And then the Atlantis mission, this was with European retrievable carrier, Eureka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great acronym. And the Tethered Satellite System, TSS, when that was with NASA and the Italian Space Agency. And this is 1992 with Atlantis. So Eureka was uh, designed to be a, a reusable satellite where you could put experiments on it. We deployed it uh, using the robotic arm and just left it in orbit. And a few years later, another shuttle went up and brought it back. But the most complex uh, experiment we had was the tethered satellite, which is an the concept of that is that you, you deploy a satellite from the shuttle but rather than just let it go free in space, it remains attached to the shuttle by a thin electrically conductive cable mm. that's 20 kilometers long. That's about 12 and a half miles. We would deploy it all the way. As this conductive wire moves through the Earth's magnetic field, it acts like an electric generator. Mm. And so it generates up to about 4,000 volts. And Interesting. Using that, you can vary the voltage on the satellite by, uh, by controlling how much current flows through the tether. And that would allow us, we had a lot of plasma diagnostic instruments on the satellite, which would study the interaction of the satellite with the Earth's plasma and the ionosphere. Fascinating, fascinating experiment. Mm -hmm. Both the plasma science and the dynamics of the tether, yeah. which I could spend hours talking about that, yeah. but we spent a lot of, and, and the fascinating thing, nobody had ever flown a tethered satellite. Mm -hmm. And so we had to, from scratch, develop the procedures. The people who originally designed the tether satellite, I think they thought it was all gonna be all automatic, that you just push a button and the satellite would go up. Our job as astronauts, figure out what might go wrong, and the more we studied it, the more potential problems we came up with, all of which required manual intervention. So we had to argue strongly over the years to get more and more manual control in, and, and in the end, we got what we needed. It was a very frustrating uh, project. Uh, on that flight, we got the satellite out to about 200 meters and then it jammed, mm. and they, we, 
tried to restart it several times. It, it was getting out of control at one point. Uh, the one thing you don't want is for the thing to wrap all the way around the shuttle. And, and so at one point, you know, we were trying to control the jets on the satellite because it, it had gone over to about 45 degree angle. If it had gone just a little bit more, I was going to have to cut the tether, yeah. push a, a button. And the, the shuttle commander was trying to fly the shuttle to get back underneath and yeah. we were trying to push the satellite. I mean, it, it was pretty hairy. In the end, after several attempts and it kept getting jammed, um, we decided together with Mission Control, you know, we don't know what's happening and we just pulled it back. And um, actually, when they first tried to pull it back, it wouldn't come back either. It had gotten jammed in both directions and uh, they had to start preparing for another contingency spacewalk. I was going to get a bad reputation. <laughs> Every time Hoffman goes up, something goes wrong. But um, in, in the end, they, they, maybe I should say unfortunately from our point of view, but they figured out a way to overcome the jam without mm -hmm. us going out mm -hmm. and doing a spacewalk. So we did get the satellite back. And we reflew it again on my fifth and final shuttle okay. flight where we did get it out almost all the way to 20 kilometers and then again tragically there was a short circuit and uh, sparks and it melted the tether and the whole thing broke and the satellite was lost so yeah. very frustrating but fascinating project i'm yeah hopefully you know, we can I, do another tethered satellite system at some point well there's a lot of fascinating things you can do with tethers which is why the initial interest in it and uh, I'm sure someday the technology will come back and, and be yes. of use. But you know, right now we don't have a shuttle, and, and th there have been uh, some unmanned robotic tethered satellite missions, and there's, there's still quite a bit of interest in tethers, but I don't think NASA at the moment has any plans to do anything with it. And then the fourth flight on Endeavour, you captured service and restored to full capacity the Hubble telescope. Right, now that certainly was the most significant and, and exciting of, of all the things that I've done in space. I mean, both as an astronomer and an astronaut, to put my two hands on the, the greatest telescope in the world up in space, I mean, what a, what a thrill. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we had lived through all the buildup to the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, it, it was it was really very gratifying to the astronomy community, to um, to NASA. Uh, a lot of publicity before Hubble was going to be put in orbit about the incredible new view of the universe we were going to get. Uh, the public was was into it. I mean, yes. there's a lot of lot of interest, and so you know the shock when my God this billion dollar telescope can't focus properly and how, how long uh, did it take until the first malfunction what we noticed well the telescope was put in to orbit in the spring of 1990 and f the what you do with a new telescope on the ground or in space it's like you pick up a pair of binoculars I mean you take the focus wheel and you go back and forth you try to find the sweet spot where everything yeah. is in focus and that's what you do with a new telescope yes. and and so I, I don't remember exactly but it was it was weeks maybe a little a month or so but it was during that summer of 1990 oh, wow. that it yeah. dawned on the astronomers who were trying to get it in focus that oh my god it doesn't focus <laughs> it, it had I mean the the images were classically what what's called spherical aberration which which is when the, the mirror, it, it turns out, I mean, there was a, well, first of all, it, it was a, it was an absolute disaster. I mean, Hubble became the butt of jokes of late night comedians. It was denounced on the halls of the US Congress as a techno turkey. I mean, it was, NASA at the time was trying to convince Congress to start the initial funding for what would eventually become the International Space Station. And yeah, yeah. of course, NASA was not very popular in Congress. And the bas basic message was, you know, go do something about Hubble and then talk to us about the station. Yeah, and, yeah. and so it was an absolutely critical mission. Yes. And I, I remember getting back from my third space flight. That was actually the only time I came back from a space flight without knowing what my next flight would be because I had been assigned to the tethered satellite before Astro 
uh, one flu because of the delay in Astro One. I had started already before 1990 when Astro flew. I had already started working on the tethered satellite, so I knew I was going to be on that mission. But after the tethered satellite, I, I didn't know what my fourth flight, if anything, was going to be. I think my wife thought I was going to retire, finally, from her point of view. She didn't like my space flights because of the danger involved, yeah, which yeah. is understandable. understandable. Yeah. But uh, it took I, three years, though, to send you up to make the fix on Hubble. Well, uh, it was actually, I came back in August of 92 from the tethered satellite mission. Okay. Um, people had been working on what to do about Hubble, you know, because the first thing they had to figure out what the problem was. And they, they figured out, it turns out the the measuring device, which you use when you're actually grinding the mirror, had been installed incorrectly. Long story that I can't go into all the details, but, but that's what led to the mirror being slightly too flat. They took a, about oh. one micron too much glass off the outside of the mirror. One micron, too one much. millionth of a meter, that's too one fiftieth yeah. the diameter of a human hair. But Hubble's optics are so precise that that made all the difference. Anyway, once, once they understood that, then optical engineers, astronomers, mechanical engineers figured out a fix for each of the observing instruments. You had to install two tiny mirrors, each of them about the size of your thumbnail. Mm. One of them, you have the out of focus light coming in that's normally, the, each camera has a little 45 degree mirror, the out of focus light bounces into the mm -hmm. camera. Mm -hmm. Well, we had to put one mirror to block the out of focus light, bounce it off another mirror, which is slightly curved to compensate oh. for the lack of curvature in the main mirror, and then that light gets reflected into the observing oh my instrument. my goodness, that was the correction. All of those things, yeah. and, and you know, there were about two dozen of these little mirrors that had to be you had installed. You had to put up 24 of Well, these. What, they, what they did was, I mean, it was not just challenging for the optical engineers, but then the mechanical engineers had to figure out how to package all these things in one big box. Yes. And they all had to be folded up because yes. you couldn't have them all deployed. We'd never be able to put it into the telescope. Luckily, Hubble was designed from the very beginning to be serviced by astronauts, so you could yeah. take out an old instrument, and that left a big hole in the telescope where we could put this big box with all the, these folded mirrors inside them. Interesting. Once it was inside, then automatic, automated. Oh, wow. But the whole thing comes out and opens up like an umbrella, sort yes, of. Correct, and correct. And all the mirrors end up in the right there place. To compensate. So you could, you could, it was, it was compartmentalized. In it, a exactly. That, that's that the way Hubble was designed. That's a great and, design and idea. It yes, absolutely yes, was yes. the, I mean, it, it, it was designed for servicing and it was, it was unique. And, it's huge, yeah. And we really showed the value of it. You know, Hubble would have been a billion dollar piece of space junk. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and we wouldn't have these gorgeous photos of the cosmos, yeah, yeah. And of course, because there was so much publicity to the problems that Hubble had, um, there was incredible interest in this rescue mission. Yes, yes. Um, so much so, I, I was told later on by people in, in the media that more people watched our Hubble rescue mission than any other space flight other than Apollo 11. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, That's awesome, yeah. that's so awesome. So then you went out with, um, with another astronaut to go well, do this, the repair? This mission was so, com it was the most complex shuttle mission that had ever been anticipated. Yeah, how did you, if, how did well, you capture the Well, there were so many, there were so many things that had to, it wasn't just the optics, the, the solar panels had to be replaced. Oh, you the, did that too. A bunch of electronic boxes had to be, there were, there were a dozen different things that, that we had to Holy do. Cow. So it was going to require five spacewalks, which had never been done before. Um, oh, you had to go out and then come back in. Five different days of spacewalking. Five different days. And why, what's the reason why, because uh, it took you multiple hours to do the first Oh, it takes time to do these yeah. things out yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, we, we couldn't, and, and a spacesuit, you can only stay out for about a little over eight hours maximum. We try to plan spacewalks for about 
six and a half hours mm -hmm. so that you have a little bit of you know time built in in case there are problems and what's which the we had and <laughs> what's the max uh, for six and a half why why is well that? you run out of uh, electrical power probably goes first oxygen yeah, uh, okay. yeah. and those tethers that the space suits tethered to the um, we are always attached by a stainless steel wire yes. to the shuttle. Yes. Um, so but that. Uh, but it, it doesn't have like an oxygen run to it. No. No, yeah. it's just a stainless wire. Every, everything is contained in the backpack. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it was felt normally you only send up two people to do spacewalks on a shuttle mission, but we had five days in a row and it was felt that might be a little much for just two people. So we had four spacewalkers and we went out in alternate days. So my partner and I went out on days one, three, and five, and the other two went out on days two and four. Wow. And we, we cross-trained on all the tasks yes, yes. just in case someone was incapacitated. And um, wow. a, as it turned out, we all did our proper spacewalks, but and it all worked. And it all worked afterward. Now, we, what we, First of all, we had to rendezvous with Hubble. How did you do the rendezvous? Well, you know, rendezvous was, we had done a lot of rendezvous at, at that point. I mean, rendezvous was developed first back in the Gemini program because they had to do rendezvous on Apollo. And, you know, basically the, the critical thing for a rendezvous, uh, a satellite is in a certain orbit, so the telescope's in an orbit. You're on the Earth and the launch pad and the Earth is rotating around and you have to launch right when you're underneath Hubble's orbit, because once you're in space, changing your orbit uh, takes a lot of propellant, which we don't have. Yes. So, so we had to launch, and, and that determines your launch time, which for December 2nd, 1993, happened to be four o'clock in the morning, which <laughs> a lot of my friends said, you know, why couldn't you launch at, at a decent time of day? But uh, it's celestial mechanics. Yes, celestial you, mechanics. You, you don't get a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I remember one of my brothers who was kind of a space nut, he said, uh, you know, a, a little less than half hour before your launch, we saw Hubble fly over, which gave us a good feeling like NASA must know what they're doing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Anyway, so yeah, you launch and you launch so that you're slightly behind the object you're going to rendezvous with and so you're in a faster orbit. Yes. So you gradually catch up to it. Yes and then you do burns, and, and your burns are guided initially from the ground, and then on board we have a radar, and once we get radar lock, our onboard wow. computer tells us when to burn and, and yep. gradually, and it's really exciting. You know, you first see this thing as a, just a, a point of light, point of light yeah. and then it gets brighter and brighter, and then finally, looking through binoculars, you can start to see the shape, and, wow. and then it gets, and then in the end, when you get really close, I mean, it's, 50 feet from top Huge, to bottom, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's big. Yeah. Um, and then how do you And uh, then hook, you, what you yeah. have to do, uh, then it's up to the, the commander flying manually to essentially null out all of the relative motion. So now we're flying together at 18,000 <laughs> miles an hour, but it, it just looks like it's floating motionless above the cargo bay, and now uh, the robotic arm operator yeah. has to reach out and grab it without disturbing it yeah. and which he's well trained he yes. did it perfectly and then we latch it down onto the uh, the work stand which then allows us to rotate it and <laughs> tilt it over so we have access to it so oh it, it, it was in, and so that was the first Thing. I, I remember when the command after we grabbed it with the arm and the commander could call down and say you know happy to report we have a good handshake with Mr. Hubble's telescope yeah, yeah, and yeah. but that was only the beginning then we had yeah. the five spacewalks to do yes, and correct. so um, my partner and I went out on the first day uh, we had to replace the gyroscopes which had failed uh, that's they're a high failure item on, on Hubble uh, they've, they've since kind of figured out what it was and the, the new gyroscopes that are in there now, because they've been replaced several yeah, yeah. times, hopefully aren't going to fail. But in any case, we replaced them. That was the very first task that we had to do, and all I had to do now was to close these big doors and uh, get on to the rest of the work. 
question, how many more service missions have there been to? There have been a total of five, so four okay. after hours. Interesting. And, and on it's been each operational for 20 years. Well, 30, uh, 30 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the yeah, thing about servicing, you know, most people, when they, when they, you ask, what's the value of servicing? Well, they were able to fix the optics. And, and so they look at it as if something breaks, you can fix it. But that's not really the most important value of servicing. The real value is that every time we visited Hubble, we put in a new, more powerful observing instrument That's because right. the technology of detectors is continually improving. It's like Moore's Law Correct. for computer memory. Exactly, and you want to keep updating it. Yeah. Hubble was launched with 1970s detector technology. After the fifth and final servicing mission in uh, about 10 years ago, uh, it now has 21st century detectors and it's almost a thousand times more sensitive than when it was launched. Yes, that so is So that's huge. the real value of servicing. That's a, that's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah, the servicing of the uh, very expensive satellites. That we and and that's what we do on the ground. I mean, you build a telescope on the ground, the mirror is good for decades, yeah, uh, yeah. centuries even, but the detectors that you put at the focal plane are continually improving. Yes, yes. Uh, up until Hubble, we didn't have the ability to do that in space, and now we do. Yes, yes. So despite the, this Hubble rescue mission being the most complex mission than, that we had ever done with the shuttle, and there were many people who thought that it was too difficult, that NASA had bit off more than, than they could chew, so to speak, uh, but we did it, and so we knew after the fifth day of spacewalking that we had done everything that they asked us to do. We had in fixed all the things that were broken, we had installed the new optics, and we came home and everybody was happy, lots of celebrations. But you can't turn on the instruments for a couple of weeks because the new instruments that we had put in, a little bit of Earth's atmosphere sticks to the surface, and you have to wait you, you can't turn on the high voltage until all that gas has escaped because otherwise you'll get high voltage discharge and you'll blow your electronics. So we didn't know if all of those optics were really gonna work. Obviously we, we thought they would, we hoped they would, but the proof is when you get the first images down and they couldn't turn it on. You know, we got back in the middle of December and they couldn't really turn it on until right before New Year's and I'll never forget New Year's Eve, 1993 to 1994. Wow. This is like one o'clock in the morning. I was cleaning up. We had had some people over. What a present. The phone rang. Yeah. So it was an old astronomer friend who was working at the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute. That's where they operate Hubble. Um, and and he, he, you know, we wished each other Happy New Year. He said, you know, you have any champagne handy? Well, yeah, we had a half a bottle still in the refrigerator. And go pour yourself a glass. I, I'm not supposed to tell anybody this, but it, because it's going to be announced publicly in a couple of days after the holiday. But we figured that somebody on the crew ought to know that we've just got the first pictures back from Hubble, and it works. And that was, I'll never forget that moment. I yeah. mean, and, and that's when, uh, you know, history was made. Was made. That's it, right. It was, um, yeah. And Hubble has gone on partly because of servicing uh, yes, yes. to be NASA's most productive science mission ever in terms yeah, of yeah. the number of papers published, PhD theses, and incredible groundbreaking new discoveries. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the fact that the universal expansion is accelerating and that we have this dark energy, which is 75% of the universe and we have no clue what it is. I mean, <laughs> it's incredible. It's, it's exciting times in astronomy, partly due to Hubble. Yeah, yeah, that's <clears throat> like you said, most successful uh, NASA project, and that's that's so beautiful. How how many decades and uh, uh, hours and lives were uh, put into to making the successful project, and hopefully inspiring a lot of young people to get involved in space sciences. Um, with Columbia in 1996, that was you, like you said earlier, the reflight of of the tethered satellite system and also the um, the third flight of the United States microgravity payload. And this was interesting. The, the tethered satellite, we, we did get deployed and, and unfortunately it, it broke. It did have an interesting effect though that the this 20 
kilometer long tether, it, it reflected light. It, the outside was, was a white, and uh, it actually stayed in a straight line moving around the Earth. It, it eventually, after about three weeks, it, it deorbited because of the atmospheric friction. But for those three weeks, you know, normally when you see a satellite fly over, you see a point of light. Well, this, you could actually see a line moving through space. There were so many UFO reports during those three weeks. And, and we actually, when we were still up in orbit, we, we saw that it fly over a couple of times. And it's spooky to see a, you know, a luminous line move through the sky like a satellite. But anyway, that was the end of the tethered satellite. And, and, but now we, we, um, we had these crystals to grow. But it was an automated experiment out on the cargo bay. However, in order to grow the crystals properly, they, they want to reduce the, any vibrations in the shuttle. So this experiment was originally designed to be operated only when the crew is asleep so that we wouldn't be moving around. Well, because of the tethered satellite, we were a two-shift mission because we had to be up 24 hours a day when the satellite was deployed. And, and so somebody was always awake. So the, the microgravity experimenters, they were pretty upset. They said, you know, they're going to be moving around. And so I said, look, it's going to be done on our shift. Give us the readout on our computer of the accelerometers and we will sort of like biofeedback, we will train ourselves. We, we will not make any vibrations. We won't bounce off the walls. They didn't schedule any other activities for us. So for about five days, for eight hours a day, we had these quiescent periods where the only thing that we could do was to sort of float and look out the window and watch the Earth go by. I mean, it was like being a space tourist. Yeah. I, it, it was incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. There I was up there, and I wasn't allowed to do any any work. Um, it was it was incredible fun, uh, and they got some good results out of it as well. And teach us about the, this the images of you when you're out, you repairing the Hubble, or where you're where you're out doing the spacewalks. You know, you gave that profound example of when it was you and then the vacuum of space in your hand. Teach us about when you're looking at Earth, and what do you feel when you're feeling this overview effect? Um, it, it's the sense of the Earth as a planet. Um, what what I, I felt very strongly, and, and I think a lot of my colleagues have expressed the same feeling, we're in an incredibly hostile environment. I mean, space is totally intolerant of human error, mechanical failures, um, and that's most of the universe is like that. It's very hostile to life. Yeah. And so we look down at our home planet, which is the one place in our solar system that we know can support life, and, and it becomes you know, almost miraculous, maybe not in a biblical sense, that depends on you know, your own philosophical background, but in any case, it's a, it's a unique and wonderful place. And, and so I think many astronauts actually come back with much more of an ecological sensitivity than when they went up just because of this experience of you know the, this the sense of awe that at life and yes. and the earth can it, it was the home of life and it supports life and and you know we need to take care of it yeah yeah and then you spent four years as nasa's european representative in paris and then you were also inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2007. And I know we, we have some time to uh, unpack this a little bit, and I know we need to get going, but um, hopefully we can continue on yeah. another conversation soon. But give us the cliff notes on the uh, European representation in Paris and then the Astronaut yeah. Hall of Fame, yes. Um, my last three flights, the two tethered satellite flights and, and the Hubble mission, they, they all had European involvement. Uh, the Italians made the tethered satellite. Uh, the uh, European Space Agency financed a good part of the Hubble telescope and provided the solar arrays. Anyway, I spent a lot of time in Europe. NASA, ever since the 60s, has had a permanent representative in Europe working out of the embassy in Paris. The European Space Agency headquarters is in Paris. 
Um, because we have so much scientific cooperation with the Europeans, NASA from the very beginning, although NASA was putting up satellites, the Europeans at the time couldn't put up their own satellites, now they can, but, but NASA wanted the best science from all the world and so they competitively would open up space on U.S. satellites to, to foreign experiments and there were so many coming from Europe that particularly back in the 60s when we didn't have email and you know so much easy communication it, w it was considered wise to have somebody on the ground there uh, and that's continued uh, obviously our communication is a lot better but still it's like diplomacy you want to get to know the people in Europe who are active in the space arena you want to get to talk with people in European governments you know what's happening with space policy, what possibilities are there for cooperation between Europe and NASA. Um, I got to know the, the guy who was the European representative when I was spending all that time over there and, and he told me that he was getting ready to come back to the States and I thought, you know, this would be interesting, so I applied for the job. Well, I got back from the fifth mission where we had flown the tethered satellite, done these microgravity crystal growing experiments, not knowing what I was going to do, but hoping that maybe I would get the, the, the European job. Well, the head of the Johnson Space Center told me uh, right after I got back, he said, you know, Jeff, we got another flight for you. We need uh, spacewalker trained astronauts because we're going to start building the space station. Soon afterwards, I found out that I had actually been selected for the European job. So now they gave me a choice. They said, all right, Jeff, you got to choose, Paris or space. I thought about it, got a little help from my wife, if you can imagine. But, you know, I, I was not tired of space flight. I mean, I, I would go up again in a minute if I had the opportunity, and, and I would have loved to have had another space flight and spend yes, four yes. years in Paris, but that was not an option. So we chose Paris, and I, I have no regrets. I had five wonderful flights with incredible, yes. uh, you know, incredible experiences, and we had four incredible years uh, in in Paris. I, I really got to know the European space scene. Yeah. Um, had and, and in addition, it was uh, you know wonderful living in a beautiful apartment at government expense, <laughs> <laughs> thanks yeah. to all the U.S. taxpayers. Yes. Yes. And, um, and, and I think I was appreciated for being able to, totally. c because of my, my astronaut background, um, I, I, in addition to working with space people over there, and, and the fact that I, uh, my French was pretty good and I can speak German, Spanish, Italian, awesome. so I, I did a lot of public relations, TV shows, radio call-ins, that, that's a challenge in a foreign language. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we had great four years. and. Uh, I had actually maintained certain contacts at MIT all the time I was at NASA. Yes. I, I came back on a few occasions and gave talks. And uh, the, the department head uh, in aeronautics and astronautics um, had the idea that, you know, we, we do a lot of work designing space systems. It might be a nice idea to have someone who really knows what it's like working up there. Yes. And so they offered me a chance to come back to MIT. and. So here I am, finally, as a professor, professor after all yes. these years. My wife, you know, she kids me. That, you know, most people, they go into an academic career, and within seven years, they're a tenured professor. Why did it take you 30? Yeah, 30 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, I had fun along Five the way. Five missions anyway, along yeah. the way, yes, and I have yes. no, no complaints. Yeah. But I'm really happy here. I mean, of I, course. I, one of the, one of the uh, things that I was I, really concerned about leaving NASA was not being connected with the space program anymore. And one of the wonderful things in our department here at MIT, we're very closely connected. We do a lot of work with NASA, with the Air Force, with DARPA. Uh, and, and so I've had a great opportunity to uh, continue my involvement with, with space right up to now. And, and you know, now I've got a really exciting experiment. I'm the deputy principal investigator of an experiment which is going to go to Mars on the next big rover, which is going to be launched in the summer of 2020. 
Yes, and this is the MOXIE experiment. MOXIE is an acronym which stands for Mars, Oxygen, ISRU, and that's a nested acronym, in situ resource utilization experiment. Mars, Oxygen, ISRU experiment, MOXIE. Yes. And ISRU, in situ resource utilization, basically means learning to live off the land, which since time immemorial, explorers have had to do that. I mean, you're sailing across the ocean, you come across a, an island somewhere, well, what do you do? You put on, on shore, you, you look for fresh water, for food. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done that in space. The astronauts yeah. went to the moon, they took everything they needed with them, but they were, they were only staying for three days. You go to Mars and uh, you have a lot of requirements, among other things, for oxygen not only to breathe, but assuming that you want to come back home, you're probably going to need many tens of tons of oxygen just to launch your Mars ascent vehicle to get off the surface of Mars, yeah. back to Mars orbit so you can get your ride home. Yeah. Bringing 30 tons of dumb old oxygen all the way from the Earth, you know, it takes 15 tons of propellant in Earth orbit to bring one ton of anything to the surface of Mars. So wow. to bring 30 tons of dumb old oxygen to the surface of Mars, we would need to launch 450 tons yes. of propellant from the surface of the Earth. That's expensive. Now, some things that are gonna go to the surface of Mars, we have to launch from the Earth. You know, complex habitats, uh, you know, the rocket to get up. But the fuel for the rocket, the propellant, Man, if we could make the oxygen on Mars, yes. we're way ahead of the game, and that's exactly what our experiment is gonna demonstrate for the very first time. It's a process which has been developed and demonstrated here on Earth, but if you're gonna rely on it for something critical, like, you know, that's your ride home <laughs> from the surface of Mars, yes. you better demonstrate it to just make sure that Mars doesn't have any nasty surprises, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to, it's a small-scale experiment, only about yay big, mm -hmm. uh, and it's only going to make about 10 grams an hour compared mm -hmm. to, for a, a real human mission, you'd have to make about two kilograms an hour. So, you know, half a percent scale. But nevertheless, we'll demonstrate the process. Exactly. Uh, I was an astronaut, I was lucky, I had five space flights, but I'm never gonna get to Mars myself, I don't imagine. But it's nice to be able to send an experiment there that someday will help humans when we finally do get our act together and, and get to Mars. Yeah, and this is, these are the, the these are the, uh, the components to what the millennials and the Gen Z and onward will be able to uh, go to Mars with the levels of efficiency that we need to sustain and make um, a consciousness interplanetary. <clears throat> Something that I thought was super interesting about that, so when we get to uh, su summer 2020 is when the Mars rover gets launched. There's only a 26 month window for the rendezvous of Earth and Mars. And then we uh, arrive in February 2021 and then Mars' atmosphere is 96% CO2. This is how we make oxygen. It's a very thin atmosphere, but yes. we, we suck the atmosphere in, we compress it, and then we put it into an electrolysis unit. You know, high school chemistry, you put these two electrodes into a beaker of water, you hook it up to a battery, and wow, hydrogen bubbles up one side, oxygen bubbles the other side, you're electrically decomposing water. You can do that with carbon dioxide. It's a lot more difficult, you have to heat it up to 800 Celsius, you have wow. to run it over catalytic beds, you need uh, yttrium stabilized zirconium electrolyte, but nevertheless, you can do it. And we've done it in the laboratory here on Earth and we just have to demonstrate that it all works on Mars. And let's talk on a geopolitical level. What do you, how do you feel about the future of the space economy balancing out competition but cooperation? How do you think we can best do that? What do you see? Well, um, we're in a new era now, particularly in, in this country because uh, Previously, it was only governments that could launch things into space and, and bring back humans from space. Now we have 
private companies in, in the US and, and now also in China they're starting up with, with private space companies. So um, we now have, in addition to the Orion space capsule that NASA is developing, uh, we have four different human carriers all developed by different companies. We have rockets which can now land the first stage of the rocket and, and recover them, SpaceX, Blue Gorgeous. Origin. Yeah. I mean, this is Flash Gordon kind of stuff. That's it, back in the 50s when I was a little kid, Flash Gordon's rockets landed vertically, but nobody ever thought we'd do that for real. And now we're doing it. So it's exciting times. I mean, we, we have a tremendous amount of innovation going on, which would not have occurred if it were just the government. I mean, there's no question international right. competition is what got the space age going. Yes. The, the, the race to the moon yes. between the US and the Soviet Union, you know, we never would have gotten to the moon without that because of the incredible investment that our country had to make, which was done because it was part of the Cold War. We learned a tremendous amount of scientifically and it was incredibly uh, inspirational for so many people, but it was the competition that got us there. Now we've got a lot of commercial competition. Yeah. Um, you know, SpaceX uh, has figured out how to drastically reduce the cost of launching satellites, and the other satellite launchers are really feeling the, the pinch. Even the, the Chinese complained. They said, this is unfair competition. He, you know, he must be getting some sort of subsidies or whatever. Man, if the Chinese are complaining that you're <laughs> undercutting them in price, you must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The 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 now with the ability to be able to go uh, and take the next steps in in the space economy, I think the creativity uh, of what we can do is just about to be unlocked at unprecedented levels. It's going to be very exciting. We need the dreamers and creators to actually be the executors and to make the blend of of academia and industry and government and geopolitically uh, come together in a powerful way. Um, just a couple uh, last thoughts on a governance level. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on this. What would be your uh, ideal way to uh, govern Mars? Well, until you get a large number of people, um, I think it will be run on a mission-oriented basis, which means you pretty much have a quasi-military type hierarchy where you have a commander of a mission uh, and you know that's that's the way we run missions up to now you know every mission has had a commander we have a commander on the space station the early settlements of Mars um, the missions they'll they'll have a command structure uh, I don't know what the minimum number of people is before you actually are going to get people interested in in self-government yeah. Um, you know, we, we would hope that our Western principles of democracy would be adapted on Mars, but, um, you know, the Chinese are in the business too, yes. and, and, and they have different ideas about how to organize governments, and I, I don't really know. Um, certainly, experience with the early colonies in the U.S. was such that, um, you, you couldn't just have freewheeling democracy where a anybody could do what they wanted because your survival depended on working as part of a group. So there's no question you're going to be in a very hostile environment and um, there will be certain limitations on individual freedom and ability to, I mean, you, you could just can't just open the airlock and go out for a walk anytime you, you feel like it because you're using up valuable uh, resources for, that belong to everybody. So, you know, the question of, of you know, what are the commons and how do you protect the, uh, yes. avoiding the so-called tragedy of the commons that we've seen so many times here, that, that will be important as well. Yes, yes. And then what type of psychometric profiles do you foresee us sending? Well, how, what types of intelligence, what types of um, genders, et cetera? What, wh what would be an ideal, because you have to live together for years, well, I think uh, you know gender max, uh, gender matches. Um, with there will be men and women and everything else that that entails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll, we'll you know we'll, I'm, human beings have been very inventive of, of 
you know, dealing with sexuality and, mm -hmm. and that, that will work. I'm not worried about that. Uh, in terms of the skill set, uh, there are so many things, particularly if you, in the early days when, you, when you'll have a relatively small crew, just because of the limit of how much mass you can send there, people are going to have to be trained in, in a variety of different skills. So, uh, you know, in the, the book, the movie The Martian, you know, Mark Watney, he was a uh, plant biologist, a botanist, but he was also a mechanical engineer. Yeah, and yeah. you're going to need people who are geologists and engineers and uh, you know, electronic specialists and computer specialists, and and so you're going to be multiple trained, uh, and you know when you're talking about a trip to Mars, you're talking probably two to three years. Yes. So, okay. you know, what are the family circumstances under yeah. which people will be willing to commit three years of their lives yeah. with not a hundred percent chance of coming back alive either? Yeah. So yeah. it'll it'll take a certain breed of astronaut to do that, but I have no doubt that there are many people out there right now in the astronaut office, yeah. you know, if you said, are you willing to commit three years of your life to going to Mars? Yes, sir, yeah, yeah. sign me up, you know. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> You won't, the you new won't have trouble finding people, but, but yes. you better send the right people. The new frontiers, yes, sending the right people. Um, Jeff, how about, uh, are we in a simulation? No, I, you're, you're talking about alternate universe and we're in a simulation of somebody else's universe. I don't even know what that means. You, you tell me what the observable consequence is of being a simulation of some alternative universe. That's what constitutes a science theory, is, is an observable consequence that can be either proven or disproven. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating you know, even something like string theory, which is a very elegant mathematical theory of elementary particles, which I'm not an expert in by any means, but to my understanding, it still has not come up with an observable prediction that would allow us to, you know, confirm or, or disprove it. Um, and, and so to be a, a real theory, it has to have observable consequences. and. You know, there's a lot of fascinating philosophy about what constitutes a, uh, you know, simulation in an alternative universe, but I, I don't look at it as a question which needs to be answered because you haven't come up with any, anything that I can test. And as a scientist, I, I deal with things that I can test and measure. Yes. And s soon, soon to potentially change, poke with the scientific uh, probe. And the last question is, what do you believe is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world um, may be things that I've seen from out of the world. For me, in, in, um, I mean, just the, the variety, I've always enjoyed watching sunrises and sunsets um, here on Earth. But from space, I mean, I took so many pictures. Uh, when, when we got back, those were in the days of film, and I, I, I heard from the people who worked in the photography office at NASA, they would develop the pictures, and they, half of these pictures are sunrises and sunsets. Hoffman must have been on this flight, <laughs> you know. So that was, and, and you know, the, the, the beauty of, of the, um, uh, this, the halo that surrounds the Earth at night, the, the aurora, which in orbit you actually fly right through the aurora. Yeah. I mean, just so many things. And, and just being able to look at the stars and from space, they don't twinkle. Stars don't, there's no more twinkle, twinkle little star because you're above the atmosphere. The atmosphere. Yeah. And you can, in one nighttime part of your orbit, see both the Northern Cross and the Southern Cross because you fly from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. And you can never do that on the surface of the Earth. Yeah. The Earth is a beautiful planet. There's many beautiful places that I've seen on the Earth and trying to pick out one is the most. But I've been fortunate enough, along with about roughly, well, fewer than 600 other people to have been able to see things from, from above. It's, uh, Know, like the old uh, uh, Joni Mitchell song, uh, you know, clouds. I've seen clouds from both sides now. 
<laughs> even looking at the, the, and one of the most beautiful things you do see looking at clouds from the top is thunderstorms, the lightning mm -hmm. propagating around the clouds. I mean, it's yeah. not individual lightning strikes like we see from the ground. It's these incredible light shows moving around. And yeah. that, that was probably one of the most mesmerizing things that, that we would see looking out the windows. To where cities sprawl out at yeah. night. Yeah, this is, these are all gorgeous, profound realizations. And I'm so grateful that you joined us on the show to teach us about your life and journey as an NASA astronaut, as well as the space systems yeah. design. Well, this I wish we had more time. We could, you we, know, we could we talk. Will, we'll, have, we'll have another, we'll have a part, okay. we'll have another part where we can uh, dive deeper into all of this. Jeff, thank you again so much it's for been coming a pleasure. on the show. We really greatly appreciate you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Share more content like this with other people. Go and inspire your friends, families, online communities, coworkers. Get people talking about space. Get people talking about what it's like being an astronaut and all of these shifts in our awareness that we can experience. And check out Jeff's links below. Also, check out the links below to simulation to our show. Support the artists, entrepreneurs, and organizations around the world that you believe in. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.